Captain Gary Martin, United States Army, Vietnam. I interviewed Gary in Wichita, Kansas. We were doing a premiere showing. It was November 14, 2006, almost 18 years ago, folks. My goodness, time is flying by. My second Captain Martin in two days here. Gary served as an air defense commander with the 9th Infantry Division in Vietnam and uh, Air Defense Command uh, Officer. So he saw Vietnam from a different perspective and I really uh, salute Gary for what he did. He was one of the older guys there, but uh, he just tells a great story and I'm so fond of all these stories. Gary, thank you for your willingness to share with me what you did. He gave me some great pictures too, folks. I'll be sharing here at the beginning of my video here after this introduction. So, but Gary, God bless you. I want to thank Brandon Glidden. Brandon, another interview by you sponsored. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Brandon has been so, so supportive of my work and, and our veterans and, and getting their stories out there. And it's so important. He's uh, sponsored a lot of my Korean War stories. And so many of you have commented that you've learned so much from these stories. And that's the thing, folks. You know, we're, we're we're sitting here, we're hitting play, we're watching, we're listening, we're hearing, we're learning. Let's let's learn to give back into this too, you know. There, there's a there's a balance there. So I really appreciate you, Brandon, and your support again of my work. God bless you, sir. Okay, folks, if you'd like to sponsor a story, there's information in the video description and on my website, LarryCapetto.com, click on sponsor a vet and you'll see pictures, wonderful pictures of my veterans. I love cataloging pictures. I've done it from day one of my veterans and that helps tell the story and they all look so glorious and glamorous and I'm just so grateful that we're able to share these with you. Um, if you want to donate to my work, go to the comment section of any of my videos and you can do so there. I want to plug Voices of History Radio too. It's been on the air now for about three, four months and many people from around the world are listening to this. I just encourage you to invite a student, especially if you know a truck driver, somebody that drives for a living, um, people that are at home, you know, stay-at-home moms that work at home or, or anybody that has free time, but you can listen to it in the car, so it doesn't have to be your free time, it could be any time. So Voices of History Radio, folks, KVOH, you can find that on my website. It's on the homepage of LarryCapetto.com. You can download an app on the Apple or Google Play stores and have it in the palm of your hands. Living history in the palm of our hands, folks. Let's use the internet for something positive. Amen. So many of you have been blessed and touched and I hear from you uh, with my videos. You continue to watch these. Hope you never get tired of them. You know, Voice of History Radio is on all the time, day or night. And, you know, if I was you know, somebody like in a hospital or somebody that just couldn't leave the house. Man, these stories bring comfort. They really do. Hearing what other people went through kind of helps ease and soothe our pains and our sorrows too. So it's better than drinking and self-medicating. Amen. Okay. All right, folks, that's it for now. God bless you. Thank you for subscribing to this channel, sharing these videos, and I'm happy to present Gary Martin, Captain Gary Martin, and uh, I'll talk to you again. Well, I served in Vietnam from October 1968 uh, through October 69, exactly one year to the day. Okay. And how old were you then at the time? Well, in 1968, I would have been 28 years of age. Okay. Refresh my memory with the Army? Yes, I was an uh, air defense artillery officer actually by my MOS. and. Uh, uh, my service in Vietnam was with the 9th Infantry Division since they didn't have 
uh, missiles there in Vietnam as a part of the ammunition or the, the uh, division. Were you drafted? No, I went through ROTC at Wichita State University here in Wichita. Mm -hmm. I graduated uh, with my degree in 19, uh, the fall of 1962, mm -hmm. and I received my commission as a second lieutenant uh, of air defense artillery in uh, January, and then I reported for active duty in uh, February 14th on Valentine's Day. Well, what was the mood or the sentiment of the country at the time of Vietnam and your thoughts about Vietnam? Well, I'd seen a lot of things about protests on different campuses and things like that. Uh, at, actually, before, prior to that time, I wasn't, there wasn't really a lot on our campus uh, per se, but uh, this was my new experience in the military and uh, going overseas for, to Germany for three years was our first assignment. So I uh, didn't really notice as much before I left as it did when I returned. Mm -hmm. Well. You're a young man, you're going to Vietnam, and can you just describe to me what, it, what, it, what you felt or what you remember about actually getting in country and actually being there, the sights, the smells, the sound, and what you experienced? Well, I remember uh, being a little scared. I, not being an infantry officer, I wasn't sure what they were going to ask me to do when I got there, and uh, I did uh, get, I was assigned to the 9th Infantry Division operations at the division headquarters level. But I remember coming into country uh, in a Pan American flight, uh, coming into Tonsonet Air Base, and I, my immediate thought was we're going to be shot down because we're coming in so slow. <laughs> and so I was uh, fearful that something was going to happen even before I got on the ground. So, but I, once I got on the ground, things were fine. So, mm -hmm. so tell me, wh where were you assigned? Where did you begin your tour in Vietnam and then and, and start? taken me into to something that you were involved with over there? Well, the 9th Infantry Division actually deployed to Vietnam in, I think, December of 66. Uh, they dredged out of the Mekong, or the Canto River there, uh, the Mito River, uh, a base it was about six or eight foot deep because it was just sand and, and dredgings out of the river. And uh, the actual uh, headquarters for the 9th Division was there at uh, Dong Tam, right on the river. But the, uh, I arrived at a place called Bearcat, which is what uh, the 9th Infantry Division used as a, uh, what they called a reliable academy to do training for uh, new uh, individuals coming into the division. And we had about five days of training and, uh, prior to being assigned to the division headquarters. Mm -hmm. So what's your rank at this time? I was a captain. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. And are you over a group, a squad, a platoon of men, or what? Well, uh, my assignments in air defense artillery was as a team commander in Germany, but uh, in Vietnam I was simply assigned to the division headquarters. I, not being an infantry officer, I wasn't going to command a unit in the, in the field. But, uh, now, did you get into combat over there? Well, our division was deeply involved in combat operations. We had uh, three brigades uh, assigned to the division. And uh, one of those was the Mobile Riverine Force, which involved the Navy. We had some Navy barracks ships that were assigned. And uh, one of the brigades actually operated up and down the canals in what they call tango boats. And so uh, I didn't have an assignment uh, per se as a combat officer because I did not have training as an infantry officer. Mm -hmm. Did you have any um, interaction with the helicopters over there? Yes, I uh, went on uh, quite a few uh, operations uh, and I would go to different uh, locations to do some coordination, so I would go by helicopter. And uh, we had the 3rd of the 5th Cavalry, Air Cavalry assigned to the 9th Division. In fact, they had quite a few helicopters there. They had Hueys and uh, light observation helicopters, and then we had uh, gunships, the Cobra gunships that were, were there assigned to uh, Dong Tam Base. Well, tell me a little bit about the Hueys or the helicopters' use in Vietnam and what they were used for. Well, uh, of course, uh, the uh, concept of fighting in Vietnam was entirely different than most other wars, and, uh, and uh, the troops were carried to their different locations and inserted. This was the term that they use, insertions, to different locations to keep them from having to travel on the roads and so forth so they could be uh, lifted into a location and uh, dropped off and immediately uh, take up uh, positions where they could uh, try to locate the enemy. So 
They also had Chinook helicopters, which I went in a few times, and I did lose some luggage when I first, when I was leaving Vietnam. A uh, helicopter blew all my suitcase and all my papers into a swamp there, and, and uh, so I got an experience there. But uh, I did ride in the light observation helicopters uh, and also in the Hueys. And uh, I would go out uh, to different fire bases and do some uh, coordination with, uh, we would do coordination with the uh, Arvins or the Vietnamese Army to make sure they knew where we would be operating as a division. Well, you know, to me, the Huey's an amazing uh, workhorse of Vietnam. Um, yeah. Uh, kind of like the, the Higgins boats were taking troops into Omaha Beach and the Iwo Jima, you know, the, the LBTs, the LBTs. Yeah. LCBPs and so the, the, the mode of transport in Vietnam, the, the helicopters. Um, so that's interesting to me, just anything that I can get out of you about that. Mm -hmm. um, were, were you around the Hueys at all being used for a, like medevac flights or anything like that? Or obviously it was used for that, but uh, did yeah. you have any contact with things like that? Or? Well, I did go uh, on one, uh, I was on one medevac, uh, when the medevac helicopter, and then I would go out on some night missions with uh, some of the uh, groups just to see the operations at night and it was uh, quite a different thing to fly at night and see the moonlight shining on the on the river. Uh, of course they had a curfew for all the Vietnamese people at a certain time anybody moving at night was considered to be an enemy so the people were pretty well locked into their homes and, and knew that if they went out they were taking their life in their hands. Tell me just a, just a little bit of your knowledge of Vietnam. Why were we there and who were we fighting? Well, uh, from my vantage point, I think we as a nation have uh, supported many other countries in their uh, attempts to achieve freedom. And of course, uh, the, uh, the concept of going into Vietnam was, for many people, was not a good idea. But as an officer in the Army, I uh, took an oath that I was going to serve my country. And as long as I was in uniform, I intended to uh, fulfill that obligation. And so, I wasn't going to let some, somebody else deter me from that as long as I was uh, willing to serve and I did voluntarily go. Uh, one of the things that I noted in Vietnam when I got there about helicopters was some of the air cavalry pilots uh, were back for third tours and uh, that was the kind of thing they lived on and uh, as a result uh, most, some of them wore uh, cavalry, cavalry hats, they wore sabers. They had spurs, <laughs> uh, so uh, it was a pretty exciting bunch to ride around with. They, uh, they'd been there several years, and so they were, had seen a lot of combat and activity there. Any, any recollections of conversations with them about the war, about anything at the time? that made, uh, These gentlemen are pretty interesting characters, or fellas to yes. be around, and uh, mm -hmm. a third tour. I mean, why, why would they go back for a third tour? Well, I volunteer. Yes, volunteer. I think I think some individuals that I've met in the military, particularly in the uh, being an artillery officer. Of course, I had a different group of men, uh, people that I was associated with in that kind of uh, operation. But in an infantry division, that's what they train for. People in the infantry are trained to fight, and uh, and some of them just take it seriously. We had some long-range patrol individuals that were. Uh, try, highly trained to do certain operations and these individuals were that was part of their uh, in their blood I think just to uh, do that so they volunteered and went back uh, many times. Tell me a little bit about your job as an artillery officer I mean are the guys out in the field calling you in with the radio and what are they saying and what are you having to do? Well actually I did not get involved with the field artillery we only had field artillery uh, assigned to the division and I had no experience with the uh, guns that they had and uh, so uh, basically I didn't have any other than observing them being uh, moved around. One of the things about Vietnam that's interesting is uh, during the rainy season everything's soaked wet and, uh, and therefore putting the guns in certain locations they'd sink in the ground so they actually had uh, platforms that they carried by helicopter through the air and would set them down in a particular location and fire their guns and then later they could pick that up and move on. But uh, I did not personally get involved other than at the division level with any of the artillery. So I didn't have any command or anything of that type. Well, were there people that you knew or at the time, friends, 
or what have you that were wounded or killed in Vietnam? Do you remember any of that? Or yes, I do. Uh, there was a lieutenant colonel that came to our division and I was assigned to take him on a tour of several of the fire bases. So we went out uh, by helicopter and uh, I was with him for several days and then I came back and the next day I found out that he'd been killed uh, on one of the boats. Uh, it was accidentally a, a machine gun was discharged by someone and he was killed. And uh, also I made friends with several art, uh, infantry officers that were assigned to our division. Uh, several that I worked with and uh, in Vietnam the infantry officers there were expected to serve six months in, as a, with a you know, unit in the field and then with a service uh, group. So one of my friends uh, went out to the unit and he was uh, injured quite badly with uh, some explosives and so forth that the Viet Cong had put in place. Uh, another friend uh, went out to a unit, was only out for a month or two, and was killed uh, in action. So I knew personally several that were killed, and uh, I think the, in the statistics I saw, the Mobile Riverine Force, the 2nd Brigade there, lost 2,600 uh, men during the uh, Vietnam War. And uh, that included several with uh, Medal of Honor awards. So. There was a lot of activity in the Mekong Delta where we were located. Did, do you think you or the other troops were conscious, you know, when you're over there of a fighting for God and country, or was it just a matter of survival for them, you think? Well, I felt like we were doing some good. Uh, the division did something called medcaps in which they would, uh, the uh, doctors and the medical personnel would actually go out into the community of civic action projects and uh, I was looking on a website a while back. Uh, they said there were over 4,600 MEDCAPs conducted by the 9th Infantry Division and over 514,000 Vietnamese were treated at, for various uh, illnesses and things like that. Many of them did not have doctors and so forth so they could come freely to, to get treated and so forth. So I could see that aspect being a positive for us and I think uh, probably one of the most difficult things was in any war when you have a, a front line it's easy to identify the enemy. Uh, I would go down the highway with the Jeep driver and see men in uh, what I call them black pajamas and, and uh, I didn't, they were carrying rifles, I didn't know if they were Viet Cong or they were just <laughs> rep uh, the uh, popular forces that were there and so it was uh, something that you were aware of all the time. You were constantly watching out for something uh, to occur and uh, I was stopped several times on the road but uh, we tried to keep moving as much as possible. Was there a strong sense of purpose among the troops of why they were there? Well the ones I talked to I think they were they felt like they were doing something positive for the Vietnamese people and uh, of course, uh, by having invasion from the North Vietnamese forces and uh, the Viet Cong there, uh, I think they felt they were doing a service and most of the ones I talked to were pretty positive about it. Of course, some were in Vietnam, you know, and uh, probably didn't want to be there, some of the troops. Well, there's an old song that comes to mind. I don't remember the name of it, but it's one, two, three, what are we fighting for? Mm -hmm. I don't give a damn, next stop is Vietnam. <laughs> I mean, you hear all these things, you know, these songs, and you hear Hollywood trying to recreate what it was like, but have you ever seen a movie that captured Vietnam like it really was, you think? I think I've seen several movies. I can't recall the names, but I did see a couple, and I think they were pretty close to what I experienced over there. Did you see We Were Soldiers with Mel Gibson the last several years? Uh, no, I didn't see that one. I had several say that the helicopter parts of the movie were good. I've seen mm -hmm. it. I think it probably captured, in my mind, what I've heard from the veterans, a uh, pretty good portrayal. But again, mm -hmm. in battle you don't have the orchestras playing and the crescendos mm -hmm. and the music, mm -hmm. although I wonder at times going into combat with those helicopters if they were playing music. Some of the guys said they were listening to radio or something at mm -hmm. times. So, But uh, it's interesting hearing things like that. A um, little bit off the, the topic of combat, um, was there, were there drugs in Vietnam? Uh, yes, there were drugs. Uh, I had an experience of uh, one of the individuals I found out later was they said uh, they restrained him from, from uh, trying to attack me but he was on drugs and so I was glad that they were able to do that. Uh, certainly 
the, the individuals went on R&R &R to Thailand and to Hong Kong and different places where they had access to, to drugs and so forth, and I'm sure they took advantage of all the opportunities they had to get sources of uh, drugs there, but I personally only re remember a couple of occasions that I, was, uh, that I was aware of, but I know there was a lot there. Well, because I've heard, you know, conflicting reports and, you know, I'm trying to get to the source of it. And I'm not trying to have anybody incriminate themselves, obviously, but I've heard, you know, maybe depending on where you were, yes and no. So it's kind of one of those mixed, mixed emotion uh -huh. feeling types. Of, I know a lot of the aviation units, they didn't tolerate it because obviously they're flying, flying and all yeah. this stuff. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, as far as World War II, Korea, Vietnam, do you think maybe it was more stressful? in Vietnam than it was in World War II? Or? Well, I've talked to several World War II veterans, and I know it was stressful there, but uh, of course Vietnam not having a front line as such, mm -hmm. and the enemy was out there. Uh, I know in our division, uh, every morning they would go out with the minesweepers to check the roads because they would be mined again. And yeah. you come back to the compound at night and get up the next morning, there'd be more uh, ordnance out there and uh, booby traps and things of that type. So it, it was not a feeling like you knew where you were going and where you were going to end up. Uh, it was a difficult situation, I think, in, that, in terms of that. How about the casualties in Vietnam, the, the wounded, the dead? I mean, were you around a lot of that or were you aware of a lot of that happening? Or? Well, uh, I did attend uh, the briefings for our commanding general every morning. Usually I would go in and attend those and they give a what they call a body count of uh, enemy soldiers that were killed or captured and uh, also they give uh, numbers of American casualties, wounded and so forth. And so I was aware on a pretty much on a daily basis whenever I uh, went to these briefings if I set in on those and you got an update, update uh, every morning. Well, what do you think the purpose of that was as far as the enemy dead for morale purposes you think or just well, I think uh, there were different, uh, there was actually Viet Cong units operating, uh, you know, undercover, and, and then the North Vietnamese Army, which uh, operated there too, as two separate entities, and, and I think tracking those and trying to find out where they might be operating uh, was primarily why they, why they did that. And uh, the 9th Division did un uh, uncover one of the largest caches of equipment while I was there. Viet Cong rifles and mortars, and missiles, uh, rockets, things like that, that type that, that were used to fire into our base at night. And uh, it was kind of disconcerting at night to lay there and when you heard the incoming uh, rounds coming in, you quickly got to the bunkers. And uh, several people around or a particular uh, barracks across the street from where I was staying, my uh, bachelor officer's quarter, uh, one came through the roof and uh, and uh, went to the first floor and hit a young man in his bunk at night. And uh, so we never knew when they were going to fire them in. They just did them randomly. It wasn't as though they knew exactly that they were going to hit a particular target within the compound. So it was something that kind of kept us, everyone on, e you know, on their toes at night. And as soon as you heard the la uh, sound of incoming or heard someone yelling, then you went to the bunkers as quickly as possible. Gary, again, help me understand what you did specifically. What, what was your specific job function again there? Uh, I did uh, coordination with some of the other uh, Vietnamese units. I would travel around. I did go to Saigon on a couple of occasions to do some coordination. Uh, and also, uh, the division did have a lot of uh, had dignitaries that did come to town. And I was involved sometimes with uh, some of the preparation for parades and, uh, and uh, reviews that would be held for these dignitaries. Uh, there were Philippine generals, there were some Australians, there were Koreans, other uh, visitors to the base. And uh, the commanding general in Vietnam was uh, General Abrams at the time when I got over there was at our base. And I did uh, meet uh, Secretary of uh, Defense Laird was there also at our operations center. So General Abrams was the commanding general for the Army? He, uh, general Abrams was there, and then, of course, General Westmoreland had, you know, was involved in, uh, in operations in Vietnam, too. Uh, we did have Bob Hope come and did a USO show, uh, just 
prior to my departure, and uh, that kind of lifted the morale a little bit, I think. But other dignitaries, Jimmy Stewart and some others, had come to our base, and Margaret and some few others. Was there a hard, harder part about your job, or was it pretty non-stressed the time you were there, or was there a more difficult part of, or how about just Vietnam in general, you being there, what was the hardest thing for you? Well, time went very slowly, of course. Every day you looked at the calendar, there was no such thing as a weekend, and uh, one day was like the next, and and you just hoped that that you didn't get uh, you know, didn't get killed or something happened to you. And of course, your loved ones back home were wishing for that also. Uh, I found out after I got back, my grandmother passed away, and she saw my name in the paper, Gary Martin, and uh, she thought it was me. And uh, Fortunately, it wasn't, but uh, I found this out after I got back. She passed away, and I wasn't able to come back for her funeral service, but that was something uh, that kind of surprised me a little bit. Now tell me again, you were over there for one or two tours? Or? I was there for one, one year, okay. 1968, uh, October to October 69. Could, could you have gone back for another tour if you wanted? Or? Well, I probably could have. Uh, actually, the 9th Division was... Uh, pulled out of Vietnam in August of 69, and uh, I volunteered to stay for an extra two months with an, one of the infantry battalions, the 6th Battalion, the 31st Infantry that was a part of the division, and they remained behind, so I stayed there for to finish out my tour, uh, thinking that perhaps if I didn't complete the tour, I might be sent back quickly, So, but I wasn't. Do you think about Vietnam anymore? I mean. 30, 40 years later, does it have a part or significance in your life anymore? Well, uh, I have a lot of Vietnamese friends. We have a Vietnamese congregation at our church here in the city and uh, met a lot of, of young Vietnamese that came over and learned the language and uh, so forth. So I have a, I have a, a real uh, love for some of those people. They're very industrious and these were people that escaped. Uh, one, some of the families went to refugee camps and uh, before they came over. So. What, how are your feelings towards the Vietnam veterans that, I don't know, don't like the Vietnamese people, you know, I mean, does that bother you? Do you, you, do you respect that or how do you feel about that? Well, I, I wouldn't respect someone that does not treat anyone with dignity and certainly uh, I have no animosity toward any person I try not to. And so I certainly would stand up for someone if I felt they were being uh, mistreated and uh, I would say at least what I felt. How about uh, the Vietnam vets in society today? You hear, you know, you hear things. Hearsay is not admissible, I guess, in court of law. But mm. it's like, you know, what do you think the public perception is of the Vietnam veteran? Those guys that are still and never came home battling with the war, or those people that went on with their lives and were successful. I mean, what what, what do you think the American public thinks about the Vietnam veterans? Well, uh, I don't, uh, it's hard for me to say exactly what I think, you know, other people might think. Uh, I, of course, didn't, I don't feel, I, I was mistreated when I returned, although I've talked to several fellows, uh, in fact, one this week that said he was spit on when he came into the airport uh, returning from Vietnam, but I didn't experience any particular animosity toward me personally. and. Uh, I know a lot of veterans were affected by different uh, aspects of the war. Some of them still have uh, mental and uh, you know physical problems that were brought on by their injuries in the war, and uh, but others have gone on and you know have kind of put it behind them. But I don't think you ever get it out of your mind. Well, you don't go through something traumatic in the case of a lot of these veterans and just forget about it. Although I think there's a, a built-in mechanism in us that we to to stay sane probably, you, you have to forget some of the bad things. Mm -hmm. Like some of the World War II guys, you know, I think some of them have forgotten some of the harder parts of war or Korea or even Vietnam or anything in life, you know, but mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you, you hear things, but uh, it's interesting talking to a lot of different veterans, that's why mm -hmm. I like doing what I'm doing, but, uh, um, but the public perception a lot of times is not reality necessarily, you know, mm -hmm. even like the drug usage and things like that, so. Um, you didn't have any problems when you came home, and you said you weren't spit on, but you didn't get a homecoming. Uh, so. Other than my family meeting me at the plane, uh, I didn't really have a homecoming per se. Uh, I uh, came back in, like say, in October, and then I 
was assigned to back to the Air Defense Artillery uh, at Fort Bliss, Texas. So I was there among friends and after that, so I didn't really come in contact with a lot of people that might have uh, had feelings toward me, I guess. Mm -hmm. But uh, my experiences were good. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know, being a, a Vietnam veteran and mm -hmm. uh, an American citizen, what does freedom and the price of freedom mean to you? Well, I think uh, I've had the opportunity to travel to many of the places that I've only heard about in World War II and so forth. My wife and I had the privilege of going to Normandy and to going to Omaha Beach and seeing the uh, cemetery there with 10,000 American graves and American flag flying. And it kind of gets, gets to you when you see, realize that what happened there uh, back in 1944 uh, when the, on June the 6th. Uh, as you stand there on the beach and as you go into the and see the places where they actually landed and realize that thousands never made it ashore. And so to me, freedom, uh, you know, means, and it means a lot to me in this country, and I think it's important that our uh, youngsters uh, get a feeling of what sacrifices have been made in the past. I was one and a half years old at the time of World War to start it, but, uh, and I didn't get to serve then, but I did serve in Vietnam and felt that I did something for my country and I realized that many young people are in Iraq now, Afghanistan, putting their life on the line, so uh, I realized the freedoms that we have are not, uh, don't come cheap and uh, uh, many more will probably lose their lives in the years to come. And that's why we're going to work together here is to get these kids educated. We need to go into the schools. No, we're going to work on that. Yes. It's important. Have you seen my D-Day documentaries? I have not yet. I plan to. I plan to. They're, they're, they, they contain everything you just said about Normandy, the, the cemetery, the landings, the beach, and it's really interesting. Um, what about the American flag? What, what does that mean and represent to you? Well, uh, as I say, when I went to Omaha Beach and I saw the American flag flying, it just kind of you realize that you're uh, thousands, of miles, thousands of miles from home and yet you're on American soil, considered to be American soil there. And uh, whenever I saw the flag flying in Rome and at the U.S. Embassy, it, you know, I could realize I was close to home, or I felt close to home. When I see somebody burning a flag, I realize that a lot of times maybe they have particular reasons for doing things. and. It's, it's not something that I enjoy seeing, but certainly there are people dying every day for them to have the right to do that. And uh, in many countries, it wouldn't happen. You wouldn't do that in some countries. Mm -hmm. Probably an obvious answer, but are, are you proud that you're a Vietnam veteran? Well, I'm proud I served along with uh, many thousands of others over uh, a period of years. And uh, one of my uh, assistants in uh, Germany was in Vietnam at the same time I was. And we went on R&R &R together with our wives. And we had a chance to meet up again and uh, talk about some old times. But uh, I'm proud that I served my country. And uh, I also realized that many uh, defected and went to Canada in different places because they didn't want to serve. But I had volunteered and took an oath, and I was committed to fulfill that until I was released from active duty. How about the, the Vietnam Wall in Washington? Have you been back there? Yes, I've been there twice, and uh, as I say, I found my name on the wall after I realized my grandmother had uh, saw that a Gary Martin had been killed, and uh, I found the name of a young man that I was assigned the survivor assistance officer even before I went to Vietnam. Uh, when I came back from Germany in May, uh, May of 1966, I was assigned a, to be a survivor assistance officer. I'd never done that before. Uh, it was eye-opening to me. I was asked to go assist a family to prepare for the funeral of their son. He was killed uh, on Mother's Day in Vietnam. He'd only been gone for a couple of months. and uh, So that was something that I assisted a family in doing and it was difficult at times but I was able to get through it and we planned a military uh, honor guard from Fort Dix, New Jersey came and uh, I was able to assist the family in preparing for the burial and having his remains uh, brought back from Vietnam. What about your mood and emotions at the wall? Did you have any or was it, I mean? 
Well, I, of course, realized as I saw the wall and its different heights, that was a uh, height is based on the number of people killed at certain times, and you see it slanting at the end, fewer and fewer being killed. And uh, uh, I saw the names of, of many people there and from many places, and uh, I saw that many people had left little uh, pieces of memorabilia there, pictures and flowers and notes and things like that. So it was obvious that many families had come to pay respects to their loved ones. So do you think the uncertainty in Vietnam, the guerrilla type warfare was, was stressful other, you know, than a real conventional war where the enemy has the same uniform and there's a line drawn? It was it's the uncertainty that keeps coming to my mind in yeah. Vietnam. Well, I think the fact that there wasn't really a front line and that, that an enemy can hide during the day and you can see them and not really recognize them, and, but at night they can operate, it makes it uh, much more difficult to, to feel like you're making progress. You may destroy uh, some of them uh, at a given time, but uh, there's still others out there. Uh, we did find in Vietnam that there were many tunnels and so forth, so they dug and buried uh, buried their weapons uh, during the day and would go out and, uh, and dig them up at night or get them out of the places they had hidden and uh, go on operations at night. And uh, so it was kind of an uneasy feeling knowing I was, felt safe inside the division compound, but uh, you, with, other than the rockets coming in from time to time, uh, I didn't feel like I was worried about uh, being invaded by a, a group of troops, you know, or something. So it's a, it's a little more difficult, I think, than if you had a front line which you knew was there and that you were making progress either forward or you were being moved back, I think. Are there sights or sounds or smells today that remind you of Vietnam? Well, I think maybe, I'm not really sure that I can pick out a particular smell. Uh, I know there was an awful lot of smells over there. Uh, of course, uh, the uh, country itself, uh, we had areas down where the tides would go in and out and the streams would, would rise and fall with the tide, so they would come in and go out. And that was very fortunate because they had some outhouses that were built out over the water and, and uh, of course, the, uh, would be taken out to, back to the river, out to sea again, and as the tides came in and out. But, uh, I remember going to the fish to a fish market in a small town by where we were at and uh, seeing baby sharks there for sale and uh, so it was an interesting interesting time getting out of the base and going to to see that the people were still you know trying to to survive sure Gary what should people remember about Vietnam well uh, I guess if I were to say something about it we always learn from history I guess and uh, uh, we don't always uh, know the outcomes of what we're attempting to do, and uh, so uh, I'm not so sure that I can give the best advice for military commanders because a lot of them have a lot more experience at that than I do. Uh, not being an infantry officer, I didn't really understand truly, you know, fully what what they were involved in, but I did see it from from a distance. But uh, I would. I would say that I hope that we never get into a conflict like that again, and uh, yet we're, right now, we're finding ourselves in a situation that's similar, perhaps. But uh, I think we always need to support our troops and to uh, provide for them in any way that we can, and uh, that's something that I plan to do. Do you think it's important that we document and, and remember, record these stories like we're doing? Tell me why. Well, I think uh, I talked to you uh, earlier about, uh, I think, going to the schools and making the young people aware of what sacrifices were made by thousands and thousands of people that never came home. Uh, young people today are so uh, intrigued with uh, CDs and DVDs and Game Boys and things like that. They don't seem to have time for, for the remembrance of veterans. and. Uh, even on Memorial Day, most people, a lot of people anyway, it's a day to go to the lake. It's not really a time to remember. And so I think it's important that uh, we teach this generation the importance of uh, sacrifice. And that's best done with such things as your Iwo Jima uh, presentation that we saw. And uh, here are these individuals that were actually there, young people, 18, 19, 20 years old. And, uh, 
it's difficult to imagine what they went through, and uh, I just can't imagine, certainly. As far as last night, um, what, in, I mean, how, how, what did you think about last night? Was there, uh, about the event as a whole, I mean, did you think it was a good event? I was very impressed with the event, and I saw several friends of mine that uh, were veterans that were there, and I had invited several people to come, and they were present, and I think they were impressed also. Um, I did see a lot of young people there, uh, obviously involved in ROTC units at their schools and things like that, and also the commander of the ROTC group here in Wichita uh, schools was present last night. And I, it's interesting to see the old memorabilia, old, uh, old uniforms and, and equipment, things like that. Today's Army is much different. We have a lot of different uh, equipment to uh, protect the soldiers and so forth, uh, much different than World War I or World War II or even Vietnam. Well, it's important that we remember. Yes, I think, uh, I think your program of remembering and providing the schools with a, a means of of uh, giving history to the students uh, will change their lives, I think. Uh, certainly somebody that's never been exposed to anything like that will not have a concept of uh, freedom and what it really means to lose it. And uh, unless we, as a nation, are able to, to uh, teach our, our youngsters to respect the flag, to uh, respect their government, whoever's in power, and uh, to do things lawfully, I think we're in for a, a difficult time. I'm going to ask you to do one more thing. I've asked all the veterans, and you may already know what the question is, but when I ask you, could you please give me a salute into the camera? You'd be one of the 300 veterans. Okay. Now, that was good, but I wasn't quite ready. <laughs> That's a good practice one. i got to zoom out. Just hold on. I'll, I'll give you the cue here. Okay. On three. One, two, and three. Okay, great.